John chapter 21, what, what uh, led me to all of that it was the fact that Jesus tended to do some pretty incredible things around food. It almost lends itself to the, to the idea that maybe Jesus enjoyed eating as much as I do. And uh, some of you enjoy a good meal, and, and you enjoy to the fellowship that goes along with it. And as we have walked through these last several messages, you have noticed that there, there seems to be food involved in several of them, and today is no different. John chapter 21, verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others are of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. And they went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. Now let me pause right here and just say that, that the Bible often tells us what's happening and then it goes back and kind of sets the stage. And this is what happened. Jesus is going to show himself again. Obviously, we're in the time frame between the resurrection and Pentecost. Jesus has already showed himself to Mary Magdalene. Jesus has already showed himself to the two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. Jesus has already showed himself to the disciples. And, and he's already revealed that there's something uh, that he's got in store for them. He's already told them that there's the promise of the Father that's going to come. And in the midst of all of these miracles and the signs and the wonders and Thomas uh, saying what he said and then experiencing the revelation of the woundedness of Jesus and the powerful implications of the resurrected Christ, They get together, and Peter says, I'm going to go fishing. Now, for all of you that love fishing, this should be one of your favorite verses. Because you could use it, chapter and verse, John 21. Hey, I can go away fishing. You're quoting the Bible. It's not hard to memorize the Bible when it fits into your life. For those of you who don't like fishing, you're like, yeah, Peter's going backwards. Mm-hmm. Backsliding again, going back to what he knows, going back to what's comfortable, going back to... And, and this is what blows my mind is sometimes we can have these super natural encounters with God. We can have powerful encounters with God. And then when something doesn't happen right away in the next 36 minutes or the next 36 hours, we're like, ah, I'm going to go back to work. Because that's what fishing was for, for, Tom, for, for Peter. Fishing for, for Peter was his career. Fishing for Peter was something he did to make the, make the bills get paid. Fishing was something he had to do in order to, 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 to continue on buying or, 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 or purchasing things that he, he wanted for his family or for himself. And so when he says, I'm going fishing, there's a whole lot packed into there. It's not just, I don't know what else to do, so I think I'll go fishing. It's, you know what? I'm going to go back to what I know. I'm going to go back to what I'm familiar with. I'm going to go back to what I can count on. You know, Jesus shows up and then he's gone. And we have a good service on Sunday and then pff, here comes Monday. I just got to go back to work. That tendency in our own lives to, to, to take the supernatural experiences we have where there's a time of devotions in the morning or it's a, it's a Bible study where God just opens our eyes or it's a Sunday service where he's right there and to walk out of the doors and because... We're not in church anymore because Jesus isn't right there. I'm just going to go back to work. I see it happening over and over in people's lives where they know what not to say in church, but when they get out of church, yeah, you wonder who taught them how to talk. I see it not just in our talk, but I see it in our actions sometimes where when Jesus isn't around, we tend to fall back into what we did before he changed our lives. Regardless of our own interpretation, this is where we see Peter going. We see Peter falling 
backwards into what's familiar, what was common. And I, I love this last line of verse 3. They got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Now, you think God knows where to, how to herd fish? You ever tried to herd fish? I've never tried it either, but I've watched dolphins try. I've watched whales try. They can get them in a bundle. But seriously, this is a case of Jesus, if, if, if you'll allow me a little bit of liberty here, <laughs> herding fish. Because they caught nothing. And these were men who knew how to fish. These were men who knew what it took to get fish. It was their livelihood. Verse 4, they fished all night, nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Let me just say this, and hopefully it sinks in. When you go backwards, you will experience a disconnect with God And sometimes it can get to the point where when he shows up, you don't know he's there. Uh, Please, please bear with me here because this is very, very relevant to our day. We have people who, just like Peter, have experienced supernatural things. You may have never walked on water. You may have never fed 5,000. You may have never cast out devils. But God has touched your life in miraculous ways. And when we fall back into the stuff we used to do that was so familiar, so common, and God shows up, it is very possible for people to get so... uh, consumed with what they used to do that they can't even tell that Jesus is there. Because as we read the story, you'll see they're not that far from shore. Let me give you a case. Most of us know a guy by the name of Samson. Samson was a man who knew God and the power of God And it was through the power of God that he did great things on behalf of Israel and for the name of God. There came a point where he fell into a relationship with Delilah. And after being tested and tested and rising up and God's power being there, he stepped over a line. He fell back into her arms, so to speak. She cuts his hair. And the Bible tells us that, Solomon, or that, that uh, Samson, when told that the Philistines were there, in the book of Judges, he says, it says, and he stood up just like times before, but did not know that the Spirit of the Lord was not there. When we fall back into our selfishness, when we fall back into our old habits, there is an ability to disconnect from God that will ultimately cost us. Verse 5, Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. See? Jesus had all the fish on the right side of the boat. He kept them on the right side of the boat because the left was the wrong side. A little commercial, okay? The left has been wrong for a long time. We better get it right if we ever expect 
to experience God's great, powerful miracles. Regardless of what side the boat was, what really made the difference is the fact that they obeyed what was said. The fact that the fish were on the right side of the boat was sim- and then that they found it was simply the result of them saying, you know what, we've tried our way all night long. Let's try this one. And I know that there's some people in life wrestling with, I've done the same thing over and over and I'm getting the same results. I got to make some changes. You see them, I see them. And unfortunately, when given the opportunity, not everybody makes the change. But they did. They said, you know what, we'll try the right side. They tried the right side, and when they cast, they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. I love this part because in my mind, my imagination goes crazy. Here's Peter out there. He doesn't know who's on the bank. And if you know Peter, like I know Peter, when somebody says, hey, try the other side, I can almost see Peter saying, what? Who is this telling me how to fish? Doesn't he know who I am? But we don't get that part. But we do get Peter saying, that's the Lord? And just like when Jesus was on the stormy sea and he was in the boat and he said, Lord, if that's you, bid me come. That same impulse, that same desire to be close to Jesus, when John says, hey, that's the Lord. He's done this before. He's told us to cast on the other side. He's done a miracle. That's Jesus. Peter says, I'm not staying in this boat. He jumps in. He swims to shore. He wants to be with Jesus. And I would to God that that would be our hearts, that wherever we're at in life, if we hear Jesus or if we see Jesus doing something, that's where I want to be. You're going to hang around somebody. Hang around people who know Jesus. And when Jesus shows up, you've got a choice to make. Am I going to be close to him or am I going to distance myself from him? Am I going to draw in To the one who loves me, cares for me, gave his life for me? Or am I going to distance myself because I don't want to get wet? Am I going to distance myself because I'm not dressed appropriately? Am I going to distance myself because I made a mistake in my past? Or am I going to let all those obstacles become opportunities to demonstrate that nothing is going to keep me from the presence of my Jesus? The other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish. Interesting little note here, somebody counted them. You see that? (laughs) 153. And believe it or not, there are theologians who have taken that one little part of that verse and just made something incredible out of it. Today, we're not going to do that. Suffice it to say that there was so many fish that it took all of them. And notice, if you will, Jesus didn't need their fish to make breakfast, but he let them participate. Bring your fish. Cook it on the fire I've made. Let's have breakfast. Jesus said in verse 12, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. All of the disciples' decisions since they started to follow Jesus 
causes them opportunities to either grow or fall away. Judas' decision to go give himself caused him to fall away from the Lord. And I'm convinced that that falling away started a long time before the actual event took place. Other disciples' decisions, when Peter cut off Malchus's ear in the garden, and then Jesus says, put the sword away, all of a sudden the disciples were like, we're not going to fight, what are we going to do? And they ran. They caused separation between the presence of their Savior and themselves and distanced themselves. Decisions we make about our past. Am I going to go back to that or am I going to walk away from that? Will either draw us closer to God or separate us from God? Decisions we make in the presence of God. When Jesus shows up, in your time of devotion, when Jesus shows up in church, when Jesus shows up when you're at the store, your choices at that point are either going to draw you closer to Him or you're going to separate yourself. The great thing about the love of God is He won't stop showing Himself occasionally to us. His faithfulness to constantly show up in the midst of our tragedies in the midst of our sorrows, in the midst of our memorials, His faithfulness and His great love for us that so supersedes our common tendency to constantly fall back is what separates Him as a loving God from all of the rest of the deities, false gods that have been put up there. And while showing up and embracing the presence of Jesus is what we see in this short story. The truth of the depth of this encounter was not over. And I am convinced that every time Jesus shows up, he has got a potential plan that rests on our ability to stay close enough, long enough to hear him speak. Because in this breakfast setting, now imagine they come in, they pull their fish in, they eat breakfast, they're sitting around. From the one verse that we read about the disciples, they dared not ask because they knew who he was. There's, a, there's this sense of, of maybe a little tension, what's going on. You know, I can only imagine if you ever gotten caught doing something you knew better. You ever been doing something and somebody says, what are you doing? And you're like, I wonder if maybe when they figured it was Jesus, some of them were thinking, oh boy, he caught us fishing. Oh boy, we probably should have been, you know, doing something spiritual. I wonder if we should have been praying. I wonder if we should have been reading our Bibles. All this kind of stuff happens in our minds as we walk through our lives. But I don't want to end with that kind of tension. I want to share with you the rest of the story. Because what happens after breakfast is even more important. Verse 15, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. Now, before we get too far, I want you to remember where, where they're at. Okay, They're at the sea. What has Peter been doing all night? Fishing. What were they eating at breakfast? fish and bread. And all of a sudden, it's almost as if Jesus throws a curveball. Because he's talking to Peter, a fisherman. He had told Peter, when Peter followed him, he says, I'll make you a fisher of men. And now all of a sudden, as if out of nowhere, 
Peter's confronted with a question about his devotion, his commitment. He says, Jesus says, do you love me? And Peter says, well, yeah, I love you. Feed my lambs. Seashore lambs. Doesn't seem to mix. Doesn't seem to fit. Fishing all night, feed lambs. Doesn't? Do do you put sheep on boats? No. Something's not connecting, is it? Something's different. I could see Jesus saying, hey, you love me, Peter? Yeah, I love you, Lord. All right, let's go catch some men. Yeah, that kind of fits. Let's go make some disciples. All right, I got that. Let's, let's, go, let's go cast out some devils. Yeah, yeah. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Let's do it. As far as we know, Peter had never been a shepherd. Verse 16 He said to him again, a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. We're talking about a career change. We're talking about hanging up the fishing net and picking up a rod and staff. We're talking about leaving the boat behind in order to spend your day in a pasture. It would be kind of fun to imagine what Peter was actually thinking. And I think he would have been thinking more about the change from fishing to shepherding if it wasn't the fact that Jesus was asking him a question about his commitment. Do you love me? Yes. Feed my lambs. Hmm. Do you love me, Peter? Well, yeah. Feed my sheep. I wonder if we could presume just a little bit, Peter's like, how do you feed sheep? How do you tend lambs? The Glazer Ranch, our WTW, is going to be taking on two lambs this coming Friday. I'm asking that. How do you feed lambs? How do you tend lambs? Never had them before. I'll Google it. Or if you have any great stories, you can tell me afterwards. But I can hear Peter thinking, You know I love you. Done deal. Feed my sheep. Hmm? You love me, Simon? Absolutely I love you. Tend my lambs. I don't know anything about lambs. How am I supposed to do this? And then as if twice wasn't enough, Jesus asked the third time in verse 17, Simon, Son of Jonah, do you love me? In the New King James, it says, Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And I think the implication here is the fact that it was getting on Peter's nerves. But I wonder What was it exactly that was getting on Peter's nerves? Was it the fact that Jesus asked him three times that he loved him? I think there's room for that. I think after somebody asked you two or three times something, it's like, didn't you hear me? How many times do I have to tell you? There's also the possibility that this shepherding thing wasn't sitting in his fishing box. And as a result, there began to be confusion. There began to be frustration. 
You ever met somebody that if you talk about what they like, man, they are all in. They're overboard. But as soon as you bring up something that they're not familiar with, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It implies the idea that Peter was about to face a reassignment. And in order to embrace the fullness of what it meant for this new assignment, the commitment to the Lord had to be solid. You love me? Yes. Do something different. Do you really love me, Peter? Yeah. Do something real different. Peter? Still love me? Yeah. Get out of the boat. Leave your past behind. Don't go fishing anymore. Don't go back to what you used to do. Don't go back to what was comfortable. If you love me, you'll change the direction of your life so drastically that people will wonder, Peter, what are you doing here? I thought you were a fisherman. Yeah, as he holds his staff, but I love Jesus more than my past. Peter, you should be out fishing right now. As he holds his staff. Yeah, that's what I used to be, but I'm not that anymore. Peter, somebody sold your boat. You know the one you fished off of? It's okay, as he's tending sheep. I'm not that person anymore. And I wonder, as we endeavor to prepare ourselves for eternity, because that's what this whole series has been about. As they waited for the promise of Pentecost that was absolutely going to transform their lives, so we are waiting for the promise of the sound of the trumpet when the dead in Christ rise and those of us that are alive and remain are gathered away, when we are looking for that land of a promise, that land that God is preparing for us, and ultimately we had better realize that when we get there, it ain't going to look any like what we left. Are you okay with that? Are we really okay with leaving everything we've ever known behind so that we can become what Jesus wants us to become in order to receive what he wants us to receive? I would venture to say that there are individuals who have got to that point, but as a general rule, most of us are still hanging on to our fishing nets, just in case. I would venture to say that there are some who have come to that point where they're saying, you Lord, I will forsake everything, the cross before me, the world behind me. Let's follow Jesus. I will give it up. It doesn't mean anything to me. I will become what you want me to become. But until we get the opportunity to actually be face to face and make that choice, we will never know just how many fish hooks we left in our tackle box just in case. And so while we understand that Peter became that pastor, that shepherd, while we understand that the, the apostles became the leaders of the flock of the church, I want you to understand that what Jesus was challenging them to do, what he was giving them an opportunity to commit to, was something that was so definitively different that if they ever chose to go back, they would be miserable and disconnected from the very one who gave us all. And to that end, I would say, we better make sure we love him. Because if you're here today, and you have said, I love you, but then you go right back 
and live the kind of life you've been delivered from, you are basically saying, I hate you to the very one who gave his all. Man cannot serve two masters. You will love the one and hate the other. Peter, you had a chance. And you decided to go fishing. And after you've been eating a good fish breakfast, Jesus wants to know, are you done yet? Are you finished going backwards? Are you finished with what used to be? Or are you still hanging on just in case? Part of the frustration in Peter's questioning comes from the fact that he was insecure within himself. He hadn't settled it. And he needed to be confronted. Today I would challenge you in the same idea. If you are following Jesus on Sunday, but you're following the devil on Monday, you got problems. If you are committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, but you're holding on to a few things just in case he doesn't come through, you've got problems. And you can fake me out. You can fake brothers and sisters out. You can fake your neighbors out, your coworkers. But you won't fake Jesus.